So two years ago, I reviewed Popstar. A movie featuring Aaron Carter that was way worse than I thought it was going to be. And last year I reviewed Taking Five. A movie featuring the band The Click Five that was way better than I thought it was going to be. Well this year we're going to be looking at another teeny bopper movie, The Biggest Fan, starring the band's Dream Street. Never heard of them? Neither do I. Dream Street was a boy band from 1999 to 2002 and were sort of the younger version of NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys. I had never heard a single song from them before doing this, so I decided to listen to their entire first album and... Yeah, it's not that they're bad, a few of their songs are actually pretty catchy, but it's clear why I don't remember ever hearing these songs. Although I will say, it is one of the most late 90s things I've ever heard. Just look at this album art. This is a pretty good indication of the band as a whole. It consisted of five members. Greg Rabasso, Frankie Galasso, Chris Trousdale, Matt Bollinger, and the last guy you might have heard of. Yep, Jesse McCartney, who will go on to have a very successful solo career and decent acting career. But anyway, about the film, this movie actually has a complicated history. Yes, the Dream Street movie has a complex history. Okay, so it was originally supposed to be released in 2002, but before that could happen, the band broke up. It seemed to have less to do with the boys themselves and more disagreements between parents and their managers. Despite Troudsdale promoting the film at his concerts, it wasn't officially released until 2002. 2005, three years after both shooting wrapped and the band broke up. But is it as bad as pop star? Actually decent, like Taking Five. Oh, you guys are in for a treat. This is the biggest fan. Have you ever noticed how miracles seem to happen on the most ordinary days? Wow, the first line and this is already some of the worst acting I've ever heard. Our main character is Debbie Warden, played by Kayla Amaria. She tells us about her favorite band, Dream Street, but seems to focus mostly on one member, Chris Troudsdale. We get an exposition dump about her family. Her mother, played by Cindy Williams in her most embarrassing role since Bingo, is a teacher, while her dad, played by Richard Mull, is a postman. And then there's her brother, Garfield. So, let me assume my mother forgot to stock the house with adequate breakfast supplies. Thanks, Hugh Hefner. This family is... odd. They seem to be made up of quirks. Like, the dad drinks weird and the brother just looks 35. Even though the actor was 18 at the time. He's played by Adam Wiley, by the way, who's been in a lot of stuff. You've probably seen or heard him before and you just didn't know it. The concentrate is especially tangy this morning. You know, I do believe that. Eventually, the dysfunction may catch up with me. But as far as your immediate future, if you could go and get your sister for breakfast, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. What? What is this family? No, seriously, this family perplexes me. Garfield's performance is just... I don't know what this is. Oh, by the way, if you're gonna keep dancing with your little cardboard friend over there, you really should take some lessons because, uh, that was pathetic. Yeah. And their dad, just watch this. How do you close the door on your leg? How is that even possible? Yes, I will. Knocked over Mr. Miyagi. You do not knock over Mr. Miyagi. He can break your fucking face. Oh, by the way, yes, that is Pat Morita in one of his last movies released while he was alive. He plays an Asian stereotype that Long Duck Dong would find offensive. Debbie meets up with her friend named Charlotte. Oh my god, he's dead! Not that they care, they just go on talking about prom. Kinda like my dreams of meeting Mr. Wright before Tuesday and him taking me to the prom. Wait a minute, let's think. It's Friday, and the prom is Tuesday. <gasps> Very nice. <laughs> Who the hell has prom on a Tuesday? We then see Dream Street member Chris Trousdale and, oh god, that hair. 
Oh, early 2000s, sometimes I miss you, and then I see shit like this. They go to rehearsal with the other four members of Dream Street, who have no lines outside of the song. Chris isn't exactly feeling well, but that doesn't stop them from putting on one hell of a show. By the way, I gave you the clean version of those events. The actual movie has some of the worst editing I think I've ever seen. It's like they thought they couldn't stay on one plot point for too long, so instead of connecting them together in a way that would make sense, they just split them up into random sequences. For example, the scene where Garfield knocks over Mr. Miyagi is then followed by showing Chris being sick. Then we cut back to Charlotte picking up Debbie, then see the boys put on a concert. Then cut to Debbie and Charlotte at school, so did that concert happen while they were driving to school? Speaking of which, at school we see this movie's alpha bitch and beta bitch. Because of course this movie has those. Well, at least this movie was made before Mean Girls, so that cliché hadn't officially died yet. Meanwhile, we see Chris getting worse on the bus, as his manager and the bodyguard try to help. I gotta get ready for my show, you know. Chris is gonna land me, he's gonna... You want somebody yeah, put somebody that on there. Meanwhile, back at the school, the alpha bitch and beta bitch brag about having tickets and backstage passage to the Dream Street concert, forcing the girls to lie about having third row tickets. Right, and I am Cindy Crawford, and she is Vendela. <laughs> you know what, ladies? Well, say what you want about these two, at least I can tell them apart. Which one of these two is Debbie and which one is Charlotte? I can't tell. They look the fucking same. Now, before we move on, I, I just have to say, this movie looks awful. Visually, this is one of the worst looking movies I've ever reviewed. It looks like it was filmed off of a theater screen. You may think that this was some version I got off YouTube. No, this is the actual DVD that I spent actual hard-earned money on. The lighting is terrible. I mean, Popstar looked bad, but it at least looked like it was done by professionals who just didn't do a great job. This looks like it was done by a college student in 2002. The audio is also noticeably bad, especially in the rehearsal scenes, which also have this weird aspect ratio changes. Production-wise, this is one of the worst things I've seen in a long time. But anyway, back with Chris. His manager is trying to cure his flu. Debbie and Charlotte try to buy some tickets from a guy on the street for $500, but of course they turn out to be from last night's show, leaving the girls embarrassed. The two have what could have been a nice moment if it weren't for the song interrupting them. Bye. Girl, do you realize that you're my everything? You're my one and only. Debbie goes up to Sulk, but it appears her poster is magic. Hey, hey. Oh god, magic's terrible, take it back! Actually, this is from Chris's point of view. He's high on flu medication and not wanting to go out to perform, instead grabs his stuff, gets in the bus, and drives down the highway. Yes, that's a thing that happens. He does get chased by the cops, but they're apparently so slow that he can crash in Mr. Miyagi's yard, get out, go into Debbie's house, which of course isn't locked. Oh, that's convenient. And go up to her room and crash on her bed. And then they show up to arrest Mr. Miyagi. There's so much stupid in that that the thing I'm questioning the least is that he ended up at Debbie's house just so we could have a plot. So the next day, Debbie wakes up to find her favorite pop star in her bed. Yes, this is our meet cute for the movie. He breaks into her room and sleeps with her. Any other context, this would be fucking horrifying. She doesn't really question it that much, she just is ecstatic that it happened. Oddly, that is probably the most realistic thing that's happened in this movie. Chris, on the other hand, is more sad that he missed the concert and not that he woke up in the room of some girl he's never met. Meanwhile, poor Mr. Miyagi is being interrogated by two of the officers from Police Academy. One of them is the guy who makes all the sound effects, and the other is basically just playing Gunderson from Fargo. What, what am I being charged with? Grand Theft Auto. Grand Theft Auto. Driving while under the influence. Driving under the influence. <laughs> Indecent exposure. <laughs> why? J just why? As the parents leave, Debbie bribes Garfield to leave for the day, so she can keep Chris a secret. Great, nice doing business with you. Bye. Are they playing? 
saying that's what girls do? Why? What does that song have to do with the scene? It's just the family leaving, and it's not even the No Secrets version. Yeah, that's what girls do. How old's that kid? 16. I swear when he grows up, he's gonna have more interns than Bill Clinton. What? I swear when he grows up, he's gonna have more interns than Bill Clinton. Perfect fa- no, 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 this- I, I, I don't know what that was. Yeah, sure. Yeah? What would you like to eat? You're gonna cook me breakfast? How do you like your eggs? I don't know. How do you like yours? Hard? <laughs> I mean, cooked? Boil. Boil. These two have great chemistry, don't they? But, if you ask the back of the DVD, Popstar Magazine said they were the number seven most adorable movie couple. All I was doing was playing my bongos. And the next thing I know, this cop drags me into this <laughs> place. Well, believe it or not, Limpo, playing with your bongos in public is a felony. Now you tell me. That was the entire scene. Chris wants to take a break from the pop star life due to all the stress and decides to stay with Debbie, ignoring the fact that he probably has a contract and his parents, manager, and bandmates are probably worried sick. Debbie introduces Chris to Charlotte. Hey, but fuck that. Let's see what's up with Mr. Miyagi. And what, you think I got him? Come on, boys' bands are popping up all over the place. So, what do you have against boys' bands? I like girls' bands myself. They think I've got him buried in my front yard. Why is he in this movie? Is that the Adams Family theme? Why are you so intrigued by that? Do you not know what a snow globe is? Granted, I don't think Kirk Cameron does either, so you're in good company. Ugh. Please keep the camera at least 10 feet from his face. It's not that much to ask. The bodyguard and manager are trying to find Chris, and it's here you notice that there are about four things missing from this movie. The other four members of Dream Street. Spoiler alert, they only have very small cameos at the very beginning and the very end, and have no lines outside of the songs. Apparently, they were supposed to have more of a presence in the film, but because of the breakup, they weren't able to film their scenes. Even Camp Rock gave a few lines to Kevin and Nick. The two cops ask Garfield if he's seen Chris, but that leads nowhere. The family goes to church, and I just realized this might be the whitest family I've ever seen. And yes, this means she does leave him home alone, because when you're apparently safe enough to leave your doors unlocked, why care anymore? All he does is clean their house, which the parents just look and go, huh. Seems cleaner in here. No one in this movie reacts like a real person. And blah, 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 more bonding between Debbie and Chris, and I don't give a shit about the cops subplot. Did you notice something else we're missing from this movie so far? Conflict? The only sort of conflict Debbie is facing is hiding Chris from her family, but that's it. The police have only questioned her brother, and she has no idea anyone is looking for him. Meaning the cops, Mr. Miyagi, and the band's manager and bodyguard have more conflict in this movie than the main character. No lucky charms must kill all of them. <sighs> We're out of colored marshmallow cereal again. Oh no, I just bought a great big box yesterday. Look, I specifically asked that we have a continuous supply of breakfast cereal in this house. Now, I don't ask much from this gene pool, so colored marshmallow cereal just doesn't seem like too much to ask for. What is this character? Debbie decides to take Chris to school so he can experience it for a day, because bringing a mega pop star to school is brilliant. Not to worry though, they put some glasses on him and no one recognizes him. I'm not fucking kidding. So he asks her to prom, they have a clothes montage, and I'll give this movie this, it at least is getting the most out of its soundtrack. Eh, this part's boring, what's Mr. Miyagi up to? Now you listen to me, you better find him on the first try, or you're gonna be digging all the way to Japan, okay? I'm trying to tell you, there is no one buried in my front lawn. Huh. Why would you have the prisoner dig up his lawn? Is there no due process in this world? This movie is so weird. Swing the spinning step. You wear those shoes and I will wear that dress. Oh, kiss me. Beneath the milky twilight, leave me. Why was 
I able to use that song twice? <laughs> okay. How did Debbie get a Chris Truesdale lookalike? That is so totally weird. <laughs> Everyone in this movie is an idiot. Also, I love that the leads are like actually teenagers while the mean girls are clearly in their mid-twenties. But Chris eventually does reveal himself to the rest of the school, even telling off the alpha bitch. But she then calls their manager and they come to get him, leaving poor Debbie alone on the dance floor. I will never forget you. Okay, that's not the actual ending, but if it did end like that, I would've given this movie a perfect 10. So this is where we finally get some kind of conflict, an hour and 14 minutes into an hour and 30 minute movie. Debbie has been grounded, I guess, and yes, they actually do the romantic flashback montage, and all I'm thinking is, wow, this movie really was completely pointless. Garfield says that Chris has been calling her, and listen to this. You're not gonna be stupid enough not to see Chris after he's called you like 10,000 times already, are you? What? Uh, yeah. What was that? Did she just achieve enlightenment? Garfield agrees to help her get to the concert because plot, and so Charlotte comes to help her escape. Young lady? Uh oh, she's been spotted. How will she get to the concert now? If you think this guy is right for you, if you think that he'll be nice to you and really take care of you, then I want you to go to that concert and spend some time with him. Darling. That's it. She just lets her go. So the only thing that our character even had close to a conflict was mostly pointless? What? You're just gonna let her go? Oh, Harold, she's in love. At 15? Oh, well, we've been together since we were in high school. Debbie, come back! You're making a mistake! So they go to the concert and the ticket lady asks them who Garfield is. And the ticket ladies, who is Garfield? What? Like I said, no Garfield, no tickets. Well, Garfield's my brother. Wait, can you imagine having a brother that always dresses like Hugh Hefner? You be Montana Weisenberg and you be Brittany Holland today. And you know what? Take their backstage passes. Thank you. Well, she's fired. Hey, what's up, everybody? Yeah, I'd like to dedicate tonight's concert to Debbie Warden. Someone who knows the real me and is still my biggest fan. Oh, yeah, and taking the band's equipment truck and crashing it into her neighbor's yard was the best thing that ever happened That's to me. That's it. That's him. That's the kid. The, the boys band kid. Yeah? He admits he stole his own bus. <laughs> and that story arc. Oh, it did no one inform the police that he had been found? The Alpha and Beta bitch get their comeuppance. We finally see the rest of the band again, of course with no lines outside of the song. Debbie comes on stage and kisses him and our movie ends. Wow. I guess miracles can happen, and some dreams really do come true. Don't you just love it when a plan works? <laughs> well, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. You made all of this up, didn't you? The biggest fan is incompetence that I didn't even know were possible. And it's hilarious! Whereas Popstar was just infuriating and Taking Five was a legit good movie, The Biggest Fan definitely goes in the so bad it's good category. It's horribly made, horribly edited, horribly acted, has so little conflict in the main story that it has to have pointless character side stories, and is so incredibly dumb that it is wonderful. Is there anything that's actually good about it besides unintentional comedy? Well, the songs are pretty fun. This was a more enjoyable soundtrack than the band's first album. Troutsdale, to his credit, isn't terrible, although that may just be in comparison to everyone else. And I don't dislike the two leads, and I think that's what makes it more watchable than Popstar. Objectively, this movie is way worse. But with that film, the two leads were so annoying and likable that it killed any unintentional hilarity that could happen. With this movie, the two leads aren't hateable, so it makes the experience more entertaining. Buy it. Show it to your friends. Play drinking games to it. There's even more bizarre shit in this that I can't show you because there just isn't enough time. Well, that ends the 2000s Teeny Bop trilogy. I own all of these movies now. But, yes, that's it. I mean, it's not like there's another movie, like, written by the manager of NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys and featuring a bunch of cameos from pop stars and... What the fuck is Long Shot? Well, I guess that's something for next summer. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you next time. Bye.
Chris Truesdale? The one that kind of looks like this? Kind of sings like, 